nobody greater than God. Share this live stream with somebody you love. We're beginning a new series tonight, but before we do, let's prepare our hearts for the teaching through singing. We we doing old songs now. Uh, Daddy's back. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you. I, we talked about gratitude Sunday, remember? That gratitude will help you out in the long run and even in the short run. Come on, sing with me at home. Well, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, because you brought me. You brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Mighty long way. Well, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Oh, because you brought me. You brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. You've been my bread. I want to thank you. You've been my bread. You've been my bread. You've been my bread. My water, too. Because you brought me. Brought me from a mighty. I feel that. Mighty long way, mighty long way, oh, you've been my bread, you've been my bread, you've been my bread, my water too, oh, you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Think about where he brought you from, well, you've been my mother. You've been my father, you've been my sister, my brother too. You brought me, yes you did, you brought me from a mighty long way. Mighty long way, oh, you've been my mother, you've been my father, you've been my sister, my brother too. Oh, you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. That's not all, but you've been my doctor. Well, you've been my doctor. You've been my doctor. You've been my doctor. My lawyer, too. Because you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Mighty long way, oh, you've been my doctor, you've been my doctor, you've been my doctor, my lawyer too, oh, you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way, but that's not all, through every sickness and every trial, through every sickness, through every trial, through every valley, you brought me through. Yes, you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way, mighty long way. Through every sickness, through every trial, through every valley, you brought me through. Oh, you brought me. You brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Sometimes I just want to thank you. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you when I pray. Because you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Mighty long way, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you when I pray. Oh, you brought me, brought me from a mighty, mighty from the top just one time. I thank you, Jesus. 
Well, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, because you brought me. You brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Mighty long way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for you brought me. You brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Lord, I want to thank you tonight. Because when I look back over my life, I know you brought me from a mighty long way through every trial through every sickness, through every valley. You've been my bread. You've been my water, my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. You've been all of that. And so we thank you tonight. Open our hearts and minds to the word of God. Thank you for bringing us to this midweek opportunity. Keep us safe from the dangers we could see and those that we cannot. And whatever is accomplished in our lives, We'll be careful to give your name the praise. In Jesus' name, we pray and we give thanks. If you're at home in the car, wherever you are, just go ahead and say praise God and amen. So glad you tuned in tonight on March 18th, 2022. The American Psychiatric Association released the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, text revision. The manual, which the APA has published and updated since 1952, defines and classifies mental disorders to improve diagnosis, treatment, and research. Developed with the help of more than 200 subject matter experts, it includes the fully revised text and references of the DSM-5, as well as updated diagnostic criteria and it has insurance codes for treatment and for payment, and it features a disorder, prolonged grief disorder, as well as codes for suicide behavior and non-suicidal self-injury. This is significant. Since I'm known by some as the grandfather of grief recovery in Northeastern Ohio, and I've introduced and helped so many learn and become certified as grief recovery specialists, it behooves me to cover this monumental development. Remember, it grieved God that he had made people. Jesus was thoroughly familiar with grief. We are exhorted against grieving the Holy Spirit by whom we've been sealed unto the day of redemption. And there are many biblical verses that deal with grief, even though the church doesn't talk about many of them. Therefore, grief is a patently biblical subject as well as a decidedly human experience. Loss and love are the normal stuff of life. In fact, there's probably no greater pain in life than the loss of someone through death or the loss of a relationship. Although we're not going to take the time to thoroughly review all that is included in the DSM-5 text uh, rendition uh, that's there, the text review, let's just list the larger elements. Prolonged grief disorder happens when somebody loses someone close and they experience an intense yearning, a longing for, a preoccupation with the deceased person. Their bereavement lasts longer than social norms and causes distress or problems functioning. Somebody tonight needs to know this because they're going through it. And even though in the church we act like we're not going through it, some folk, and in some many churches, and although we are acting as if we are healed, there's some folks that are still struggling. It is not the intense yearning or longing for or preoccupation with the deceased person that's pathological or sick, but the interference with identity and the interference with productiveness. 
Let's look at the symptoms of prolonged grief disorder because there is great confusion going on between adaptive grief and prolonged grief disorder. Here are the symptoms. Identity disruption, feeling as though part of yourself has died. A marked sense of disbelief about the death. Avoidance of reminders that the person is dead. Intense emotional pain, anger, bitterness, sorrow related to death. Difficulty with reintegration into life. Emotional numbness. Feeling that life is meaningless. And intense loneliness. Feeling alone or detached from others. When does this occur? It can happen when someone close to the bereaved person has died at least 12 months earlier for, it, for adults or at least six months earlier for children and adolescents. Sometimes we don't think about children or adolescents grieving, but they're grieving also. Why is prolonged grief disorder important right now? The circumstances in which we are living. With almost a million, I didn't check this since I did the sermon, with, I, I, I produced the sermon, but almost a million deaths due to COVID may make prolonged grief disorder even more prevalent. Grief in these circumstances is normal, but not at certain levels and not most of the day, nearly every day for months. Praise God, help is available. Let me stop for a moment and normalize what I'm doing because the church world, which includes the black church, still has a very difficult time acknowledging and dealing with psychological issues and mental health. Even today, I was corresponding with someone who was sharing with me a loved one has, been, has entered into a grief, a time of grief, doesn't know about grief recovery, doesn't want to deal with grief, doesn't want to be labored down and stuck with their sorrow, or I don't want to go back in to where I was, not understanding that there is a healthy process by which you can deal with grief. At the house of the Lord, because of my ongoing teaching, it's much easier to talk about mental health. But I'm not convinced that we're getting help just because we're talking about help. We need to make sure that we are going and taking care of and going to mental health practitioners. Christian folks who are practitioners who can help us deal with these mental issues. Nevertheless, new research on grief is going on all the time. In her new book called The Grieving Brain, neurologist and psychologist Mary Frances O'Connor writes that grief is the cost of loving someone. Now, let me just stop right there because that, that's powerful. That's, that's power. Grief is the cost of loving someone. That's profound. If you love somebody, eventually it's going to cost you. And one of the costs is grief, and nobody gets away without paying. So a lot of folks just say, I won't love nobody, and I won't have any grief. But that won't get you out because human life is going to take you there regardless. The normality of grief is seen in the Bible, seen in the life of Jesus. The Bible reads in some verses on the suffering servant, which, is, which was prophetic of Jesus. Isaiah 53 and 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Jesus was acquainted with grief. Sounds like he was vaguely familiar with it. But the word that's used in the Hebrew is yada, which means to know or to be intimately familiar with. Jesus was thoroughly, intimately familiar with grief, infirmity, and sickness. Let's look at the New Living Translation, second edition. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief, and we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Jesus loved the world to the uttermost, and he paid the price of grief. We have learned a great deal about grief through the grief recovery certification, the grief recovery method, 
my extensive teaching on the subject, but there's still so much more to learn, and particularly from science. Science is another lens to look at reality. I've already taken one quote from this fascinating new book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. This groundbreaking book reveals more powerful new information about grief from a neurological study, or uh, neurological science, the study of the brain. Some of the information affirms what we've already learned, but some of it contradicts what we've been taught. So let's review some of the significant learnings in this book. I'm going to do about five sermons, not long, just enough to try to highlight some big stuff to make sure that we are moving healthily through our grief. The truths that we should entertain flow from functional magnetic reson resonance imaging, FMRI. Losing our one and only overwhelms us because we need our loved ones as much as we need food and water. Let me stop for a minute. Another profound fact. This is not an addiction. It is not about addiction to water or food. It's about actual need. We need people in the way that we are diminished when they are gone. This includes the death or loss of a relationship. So it's like needing food because some folks are like, you ought to just get over that and go on. No, it's like food. You need food. Now, you could be addicted to food. That's another issue. But you need food. You can't do without it. You need relationship. You need certain people. To be addicted to them is another issue, but you can't do without relationship. We need people. And so they are important, Dr. O'Connor writes, after decades of, real, of research, I realize that the brain devotes lots of effort to mapping where our loved ones are while they are alive so we can find them when we need them. I have just read a trilogy of books by John Bowlby on attachment. He also talks about the importance of the maps that our brain makes. And I'll explain this some more and we'll go into it a little bit more. But it's like when you come down at night and you walk through um, your, your dining room and it's dark and you expect to hit the dining room table because your brain has a map of how it is that it operates in there so that you can operate and walk and not, and not hurt yourself and know what's going on. Well, your brain creates relationship maps so that you know where people are so you can locate them when you need them. Grieving requires the difficult task of throwing out a map that we've used to navigate our lives together and transforming our relationship with this person who has died. So you have a map of that person, how you interact with them, how, how you uh, share with them, grieving or learning to live a meaningful life without the loved one is ultimately a type of learning. You gotta learn how to deal with this person according to a new map. Now consciously, you know what's happened, but subconsciously, that map takes time to reform because learning is something we do our whole lives. Seeing grieving as a type of learning may make it feel more familiar, more understandable, and give us the patience to follow this remarkable process to unfold. By the way, that learning of the new map is why grief takes time, because it's going to take time for you to figure out what it's like to deal with the, when that person who's been there all along is no longer there and your brain is remapping. I'm going to be quoting from the book, but I cannot commit plagiarism by printing those quotes for you, so I'd highly recommend that you get the book, and although it's full of scientific scientific information is very readable. On the one hand, she writes, there is grief. The intense emotion that crashes over you like a wave, completely overwhelming, unable to be ignored. Grief is a moment that recurs over and over. However, these moments are distinct from what she calls grieving the word that he uses to refer to the process, not the moments of grief, but the process of grief. And that grief process has a trajectory. It is going somewhere. I've often used the metaphor of grief being like waves at the beach to try to help people. They come in and then they go out 
You can't do anything about it. You must learn to accept the ways of grief. Dr. O'Connor differentiates once again between moment of grief and the process of grief. The process of grieving has a trajectory or a path. I want you to understand that grief never ends. And it is a natural response to loss. You will experience pains of grief over a specific person forever, at least as long as we're on this earth. And you will have discrete moments that overwhelm you even years after the death when you have restored your life to a meaningful, fulfilling experience. A, a, a grief can come in like a wave at certain time and overwhelm you, overwhelm you. But whereas you will feel the universal human emotion of grief forever, your grieving, your adaptation changes the experience over time. You learn more how to walk it through. You learn more how to deal with it. You learn more as your uh, uh, brain map updates you so that you know what's going on. Even if the feeling of grief is the same, your relationship to the feeling will change over time. You ought to praise God that you are not, I don't care what you think or feel at the moment, stuck and can't go forward in time, it will change, it will evolve, things will move because that is the way life is. Adopting the mindset that grieving is a form of learning, that's what we're talking about tonight, and that we are always learning, and I believe in lifelong learning, may make the winding path of grief more familiar, more hopeful. You've got to go through it because you've got to learn some new information. You've got to go through it because you have to relearn that I now must live life and that person is no longer there. Your brain must update its map so that you can begin to operate without that person and that takes time and work and, and you have to work through it, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel. There's much to learn. There's so much to learn that can help us. I hope you'll tune in every Wednesday and get this information. I hope you get the book and start reading it because it's going to be so much I can't touch. But I want to equip you in order to be able to deal with life's circumstances and issues and trouble. And so this will help us to more successfully navigate the process of grieving. Please stay with us for the next four Wednesday nights. And if you're not coming on Sunday morning, we're dealing with another very important subject, sanity. The peace of God guards, safeguards our sanity. And we need some safeguarding right now. Can I pray for you tonight? Because, I mean, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of loss. There's a lot of changes going on. There's a lot of things happening. And you probably have not really considered because of the way we are in our world that it's normal for you to be hurting. It's normal for you to be working through. And when you lose relationships, it's normal to be in pain. It's normal to be have to work through something because now the people are just like well what uh, so, you know just pray god god will heal you god well yeah he's gonna heal me but i gotta work through some stuff because of the importance of relationships father i pray tonight for somebody that's lost a loved one for somebody that lost a relationship a person walked out of their life something happened a fracture took place and their life and their relationship was broken. Oh God, tonight, touch them, begin to work in their heart and help them to work through the grief that is there. I pray, Lord, you can even uh, heal the relationship. You can put it back together, but uh, he said as much as it lies within you, live peaceably with all men, but sometimes it doesn't lie within you. And therefore you have to let it go you can't deal with it. You can't work your way through it because the other person won't allow it. But you can heal them. And if you don't heal because they won't allow it, would you just help the person work through their grief? I thank you tonight 
for all that you do and all that you are. And I'm going to ask you to begin to heal and work in somebody's life right now and allow us to be able to understand more and more about the grief process as we work through it. In Jesus' name, we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Thanks for your faithfulness. Let me encourage you to use electronic means of giving. Continue to do that. And although we have new realities and things, I was reading somebody sent me the news today. That, 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 the, the numbers are going back up. So we just want to be careful. We will continue to use those protocols at church here. It's important. We love you. We're concerned about your safety. Brother Woods, I'm not sure what I got, but I got, I know the plan. So let's, let's do that one. G flat. And if it's another one, I'll, I'll change it for Sunday. God's got ideas and plans for you. Thank you, sir. I know the plan I have for you. Declare the Lord. God sings over you because he loves you. I know the plan I have for you. Declares the Lord. God says over you plan. Plan to prosper you. Plan never to harm you. Plan give you hope and fear. These are the plans. These are the plans. These are the plans I have for you. He's got plans for you, so now. I did it the other way around. We're going to make our affirmation based on the plans that he has for me. As we give today's offering, we proclaim on the basis of Habakkuk, I got to yet praise. And therefore, despite economic depression, sad circumstances, are you saying that at home? Food shortages, stock market, unemployment, gasoline prices, housing market, terrorism the pandemic yet will I praise you because you got a plan for my life I praise you with my manners my mouth my material my walk my words my worship my practices my pronouncement and a portion of my paycheck I got a yet praise and I affirm that yet praise with the highest praise word Hallelujah. God's got a plan for you. That means he's got ideas, a vision for your life. Seek him and walk in it today. God bless you. See you Sunday morning, 1030. Come on out. Let's ready to praise God. He's good.